Well, good evening, everyone. I'm Reverend Richard Nordgren, associate member of St. John's Lutheran Church. And uh, I am the one who will be leading this class on biblical study tonight. We're glad that you're here with us. And it is our sincere hope that this will be a rewarding and growing growth experience for you. Holy Scripture is the foundational document for Christians. God has chosen to make self-revelations, you know, which have, were recorded and which have come down to us over the course of centuries. Because the Bible is so fundamental, we at St. John's believe in in-depth knowledge and understanding of what God has chosen to make known to us is of great importance. This, this class will meet every Sunday you know, at 8 p.m. There'll be some exceptions, such as, uh, as holidays. And each class will last approximately one hour. Questions and discussion are welcome. Uh, respect for the opinions of others will help foster a climate of openness and inquiry. From time to time, you may be asked to read a passage of scripture, either silently or aloud for all to hear. So please have a Bible at hand. Finally, loving kindness is both a revealed characteristic of God and a quality scripture encourages we develop. Loving kindness is shown in a variety of ways. That includes offerings and donations. If you feel moved to donate to St. John's, your gift will be greatly appreciated and will be used for the ministry of the church. There may be other ministries and good causes that you may feel drawn to as well. By all means, give to them also. The point is to develop an attitude of loving kindness for others. And so with that, let us begin. Last week, we uh, started a study of some of the parables that, that Jesus used uh, to teach and instruct um, his followers and those who were curious about the, the nature of God's kingdom that he was announcing. Uh, we have learned before that, that you know, Jesus was a man on a mission. You know, he believed in the deepest parts of his heart that the kingdom of God was at hand and that it was up to him to make the birth announcement. However, his reluctance to identify himself as the agents of its Unbreaking, coupled with his decision to make the announcements to limited audiences, it kept those for whom this was good news to a few in number. Jesus did not use his superpowers you know, to broadcast the message worldwide. He taught as a sage and a storyteller would tell. He functioned as a healer. And given the gospels recorded and preserved so many of the parables, it seems that um, this was among his favorite instructional devices. So once more, let's explore the, the, the parables. Uh, I, I think I can say without you know, the slightest whiff of controversy that the parable of the Good Samaritan uh, would be probably in people's top five, if not top three, you know, well-known parables. Uh, it is a parable that is found only in Luke. It is not found in John, Mark, or, or Matthew. But in Luke 10, 25 through 37, you know, uh, Jesus you know, uses this parable to instruct you know, an inquirer um, about his message and his point about the, of the kingdom and what it's like. So, before we get into the parable in great detail, I think it's helpful to establish you know, the, the settings and the, the parameters of how this parable came to be used. Uh, it uh, got teed up by a lawyer you know, who asked Jesus a question about how he could have eternal life. Um, the fact that he was a lawyer you know, is a, uh, a tip-off, uh, and one which uh, probably would be best if we, um, as we, as we approached it gingerly, you know, being somewhat on guard 
but not sure of what his motives or intentions were. For the lawyers, um, you know, they were the, the experts at the uh, interpretation and understanding and teaching of what the requirements of God's law you know, made on you know, God's people. One would think, you know, someone as well versed in the covenant um, and writings of the Jewish people um, would uh, find you know, people coming to him, asking him that question, and he would be able to give them their answer. But it uh, strikes me somewhat strange that uh, he comes to Jesus and asks him what he must do to have eternal life. Um, and perhaps Jesus was on guard because of the person who asked the question, uh, his role, and the nature of the question itself. And so you know, he uh, stepped back and answered a question with a question. You know? And uh, Jesus you know, said, uh, well, what does scripture you know, tell us? You know, what is, what's your understanding? You know? And uh, the, uh, the lawyer, you know, who was well-trained, uh, answered correctly that uh, you know, the, the first uh, um, law of, or the highest commandment is to love God with everything that we've got, you know, without restrictions or limits or uh, reserve. And the second part uh, of that, uh, that great commandment is to love you know, your neighbor as yourself. And uh, so the lawyer you know, gave the correct answers and Jesus congratulated him on uh, his, his understanding, his knowledge and wisdom. And uh, uh, he uh, you know, said, if you do all these things, these two things, you, know, you will um, have eternal life. You know, we're not into the parable yet, that's coming. But so far as the story has been teed up, you know, um, we, uh, we have you know, certain important tidbits of, of information which are revealed to us and some pretty important stuff you know, that is, uh, is buried in, in the details. For example, you know, uh, the Jewish people you know, had a well-functioning you know, system for restoring relationships that had been uh, broken or distorted you know, by, by sin. Whether that broken relationship that exists between the, the nation and um, um, God, or whether it was uh, a broken relationship between two or more individuals, uh, but there was a way of you know restoring those broken relationships and um, and reconciling people to to God and to to one another. Um, the answer that Jesus applauded you know, suggests you know, rather strongly that uh, um, eternal life was not dependent on faith in Jesus himself as the savior. That doctrine would get developed much later, but at this point, Jesus was congratulating the man for understanding that you know, he obeyed you know, the, the, the covenant requirements to love God without restriction. You know, neighbors, you know, as we would not want ourselves to be treated, you know, and it didn't hinder or depend on uh, having some outside agency such as the, the Christ you know, making that possible. The uh, third thing which you know, gets lifted up uh, at the preliminaries you know, to this, uh, this parable is that uh, salvation lay in the hands of the individual and not the nation. In other words, you know, uh, what Jesus endorsed was the proposition that you know, if there's a few good people you know, in the midst of others who are unrighteous, um, those few good ones you know, will inherit the kingdom of God uh, and the rest will forfeit it. So, uh, this is a very different proposition. Um, um, it is a proposition that we in the 21st century are probably very familiar with because we're used to thinking of ourselves as individuals rather than as members of a collective, you know, um, such as a nation. Um, and throughout the, the time from Abraham up to Jesus, you know, the, the 
you know, the focus of attention was on Israel as a nation. It was had very little to do with individuals uh, who were either you know, good, bad, or indifferent, um, except for the kings, you know, who were supposed to be God's agent, you know, and guiding, correcting, leading, discipline, disciplining their subjects, you know, into the ways that were pleasing to God and which would make them righteous. So the you know, the the whole sweep of history from Abraham, when you know God said to to him. Uh, you and your descendants will be my people, uh, and I will look out to you. you know? And so that's a that's an important shift you know, from you know the the nation being the focal point to the individual uh, being the focal point. Yeah. The uh, the fourth thing which is embedded in you know, this uh, setup is the uh, notion that salvation was available to all. Was not just you know open to to Jews you know, um, as a most favored nation. Now, for Gentiles, that's great news. Yeah, um, you know we we don't have to convert to Judaism. We don't have to be born into it. You know, uh, to reap the benefit of God's blessings. You know? um, it's something that which probably you know Jews at the time you know, of Jesus and the more observant devout ones today would find you know sort of reckless. You know? Oh, what do you mean? You know, it's saying something like that. Does you know? Didn't God reveal to our ancestors that we were the most favored nation? Um, and what Jesus is endorsing is a no. Well, the uh, the parable begins with a follow-on question. You know? That's an important question. Uh, who is my neighbor? Is it Someone that's part of the you know the same community where I live in, a member of my household, you know, or the family next door, uh, is my neighbor, you know, someone who lives in the same geographic region, uh, my neighbor, someone who endorses the, the same political and social and cultural beliefs that I do, you know, is my neighbor, uh, someone who. Um, uh, you know, is part of you know a greater whole. All my all the Americans, you know, the rest of the world, you know, they take care of themselves. Uh, so the question is, you know, who's my neighbor? And this is where the you know the parable begins. You know? And Jesus tells the story you know, of a man who was going from you know, Jerusalem to Jericho, which, by the way, was the reverse of the pathway uh, that Israel took when it entered. Uh, um, Canaan and occupied it. So this guy, you know, we don't know anything about him. You know, we don't know whether he's tall, ugly, handsome, you know, had money, you know, we don't know anything about him, except that he was making this journey. And on his journey, he is beset by, by bandits you know, who uh, beat him up something horribly, you know, stripped him you know, of all his belongings and left him in the, uh, literally on the side of the road to die. Uh, you know, the story continues. He, you know, Jesus said, then a priest came by going to Jerusalem, saw the man laying in the ditch on the side of the road, you know, and stepped aside and continued on his journey. Um, likewise, you know, a, uh, a Levite came by, and uh, he too you know, saw the man in the ditch, stepped aside, he continued on his journey to Jerusalem. A Samaritan saw him, and he was filled with compassion. So he stopped and tended to the man's wounds, uh, took him to an inn, and paid for his recovery. And Jesus then asked the question, you know, of the three, who was the neighbor? Who fulfilled the commandment found in Leviticus 19.18 to love your neighbor uh, as yourself? Of course, the, the question is, Jesus asks, it's entirely rhetorical. You know? um, any answer other than the obvious one is to impute a priority of ritual observances you know, over the kind and compassion people in need. Um, a little thing, a couple of things about you know the uh, the characters in this parable, this story. Okay, 
And I said, you know, the man who got beat up, we don't know anything about him, uh, except that he's in a world of hurt. Uh, then there's the priest and the Levite. You know, these people were religious functionaries. Uh, and they they took turns you know, amongst themselves of uh, serving in the temple in Jerusalem. And you know, as Jesus tells the story, it's you know, it's likely that this was their turn you know, to to go to Jerusalem and to uh, uh, you know serve in the temple. But there's a catch. Uh, in order for them to fulfill their God mandated duties, that was their call. You know, priests and Levites, you know, were the you know, keepers of the rituals and sacrifice. For them to be able to do that, they could not be contaminated by the blood of anything that was living. So if they had stopped to help the man, you know, they would have become contaminated. They would have been, you know, ritually impure and unable to fulfill the responsibilities that, that God had you know, given them to carry out. So in, in some sense, the you know, um, fact that they, they failed to stop and help you know, um, was consistent with the way that they saw themselves functioning as you know, uh, God's people. You know, um, what they were doing is perhaps you know, difficult you know, to pass by this, this man who was neither hurt. Um, but it was the, the correct thing to do if it is assumed that ritual observances are of the greatest importance. So they may have experienced some angst about you know, not being able to stop but they understood what their calling was, understand what that calling required of them. And they made the, the choice to uh, uh, pass by and hope somebody, somebody else would uh, come by and render first aid. Um, the uh, Samaritan, well, I think most people have, you know, and I, I understand Samaritans that you know they um, were not friends with the Judeans or the Galileans. Um, they they were you know, re, you know related in the same you know, religious tree if you will. Um, but you know, <laughs> there were significant differences you know, that separated them and which over the the, the course of centuries you know had um, caused a lot of ill will and hard feelings. Um, and so you know, Jesus is saying that you know, the neighbor, the person who observed God's requirements laid out in Leviticus uh, uh, 19 verse, uh, verse 18, was someone that most Jews would have you know, despised uh, and hated. Um, and uh, you know, so we can look at this story as a, you know, uh, a morality tale, you know, go and do likewise, model your be own behavior after what the, the Samaritan did, you know, stop and help strangers who are in distress, you know, um, extend yourself beyond your comfort zone and, you know, reach out to people that, uh, that need, a, need a hand. You know? um, and yeah, that's good. It's all good. You know, I hope we all do that. You know, that uh, you know, we, uh, you know, those of us who are living in New York City, you know, find ample opportunities uh, on a daily basis you know, to to see people in need and do something as we are able to do that. You know? But if we just stick at that that level of you know, you know, do good deeds to people, you know, I think we miss some of the really important. <laughs> points of this parable. Yeah. Um, as Jesus observed in, in Matthew 5, 43, yeah, um, the sun which God created shines on all people, the good, the bad, the ugly, the indifferent, you know, doesn't matter. Yeah. Um, God is uh, 
also you know, generous to all who come and ask for help. And in this case, you know, God acting through the Samaritan, you know, provided generously to the, the man who was in great need. Another way you can look at this, you know, is that um, other than as um, an assessment of you know, personal moral behavior, um, is that uh, God has no favorites anymore. Whoever and whatever you know, God has to give, he gives generously to all. Uh, the Gentiles you know, might have said, wow, that's really something. That's really good news. You know? um, but in the Jewish community, uh, there probably would be a loud cry of, wait a minute, you know, you're changing the rules in the middle of the game. If this is what Jesus was announcing about the kingdom of God, that Israel is no longer a most favored nation, set apart, which had been set apart for special treatment, then some explanation ought to be forthcoming. No. For example, what about the unrepentant sinners you know, who receive God's blessing and continue in their unrighteous ways? Where is justice in this new arrangement if God has no enemies? What is the incentive to be good if God has no special friends? It, it seems so obvious that this parable, when you get into an, an in-depth analysis, is just not a you know, sweet, encouraging story about compassion and care for all. You know, it's not just another you know, story about um, compassion and love you know, for our fellow human beings being more important than rituals and traditions and customs. You know? um, buried in this parable you know, is a radical vision, revision of the promise that uh, God made to Abraham, where in essence he said, Hear, O Israel, I'm your God, the Lord, who shall be your God and bestow special benefits upon you. And this was uh, uh, ratified uh, and endorsed you know, at Sinai. Um, the only change that Sinai made is that you know, the provision that you, know, you want the blessings that come from heaven, you, know, you have to be doing heaven's will. With this revision, Jesus announced you know, that there was a new definition of neighbor. It wasn't just you know, the fellow Jews. You know, it wasn't just the, the people who can claim Abraham you know, uh, and Isaac, and Jacob and Joseph as their, as their ancestors. Um, this was a extension of blessing, you know, which now extended and encompassed the whole world not the whole universe. Um, and there's a, that's a brand new definition of, of what neighbor is from what Jewish people in the time of, of Jesus would have, you know, would have defined that word. They would have said, my neighbor you know, are, are those like me who are part of God's covenant, uh, who exist in a preferential relationship with God uh, and who are seeking to, to do God's purposes and, and will. Yeah. Um, so if God no longer you know, has enemies and no longer has a special friend, you know, the question asked just uh, a little while ago, well, where is justice in this if unrepentant sinners continue to receive blessings? Uh, and, uh, you know, those who have you know, sacrificed uh, for God, who have tried to be decent human beings, you know, they seem to get you know, the dirty end of the stick. And uh, where's the fairness in that? Um, so there's another parable which answers those questions. You know? um, you know, with the new definition of neighbor, um, you know, and the question about where is divine justice? You know, where, where is that going to be uh, delivered? Um, and probably you can read into the parable of the Good Samaritan an implicit understanding that um, 
um, that final reconciliation of accounts, you know, that uh, final judgment, you know, is some something that's going to be off in the future. Yeah. Um, but there's uh, there's some parables which you know, talk to this, uh, and uh, it also you know is a parable which is well known, the parable of the sheep and the goats. You know? Uh, which also is found only in Matthew chapter 25, verses 31 through 46. So it's also a, a very long parable. Um, and I think it needs to be that way to, to get you know, its uh, full impact. You know? And it's one of those parables you know, that uh, does not begin with the standard you know, declaration, the kingdom of God is like. Kingdom of God is like a, a mustard seed. The kingdom of God is like leaven. Yeah? Um, those define the characteristics of uh, the kingdom that Jesus was proclaiming. This set of parables, which does not begin with that opening declaration, uh, uh, tend to be parables of judgment. Yeah? And um, that's what the, the parable of the uh, sheep and the goats is yes, it's a parable of judgment. It's set in some future time when Jesus, as the Son of Man, you know, returns to earth uh, to settle accounts. And uh, he does sorting out uh, on his right hand side, he sets the sheep, left hand side, you know, he puts the goats, and um, yeah, then he, you know. Acting as the an imperial judge, you know, he's the head of this kingdom. Uh, he pronounces verdicts. You, addressing the people who he had set to his right, you know, the sheep, you know, come and receive your reward for the kingdom belongs to you. The fortunate ask, huh? Us, me? Why us? What's so special about us? And uh, Jesus said, well, you've taken care of me. And there was a big, huh? And Jesus said, yeah. when you did kindness, did kind things you know, to the least of anybody on the face of the earth, you did it for me. When you helped a person in need, you, know, you did it to me. Um, and in this judgment, you, know, you will receive your reward. Um, of course, those on the left hand side says, Oh, wait a minute. We didn't do anything all that bad, did we? And Jesus said, yeah. Well, your failure to provide assistance, your failure to render aid, your failure to do what you were able to do to make a difference in the life of a person in need. You know, that is what has condemned you. Uh, and so he said to the sheep on his right, come, let's go you know, and enjoy the kingdom. You know? And the others were left behind you know, to experience the joys of being in God's presence for eternity. The parable of uh, final judgment you know, answers the, the question that uh, <clears throat> people had about where is justice, you know, when bad people continue to you know, have good things going on in their life? Um, the, the answer is this parable would suggest, you know, very clearly is that some future date, you know, there will be a sorting out. You know, and those who have um, done bad things, you know, will receive the consequences you know, of that. Whereas those who have been good you know, will be blessed you know, for all eternity. Um, embedded in, in, in this explanation about you know, delayed justice you know, are a number of points that I think um, you know, help us understand um, not only this parable, but you know, just how profound you know, it is for the, the life of, of, of believers. Um, this final accounting uh, how judgment will be determined and the verdict rendered you know, uh, is determined by the quality and quantity 
of caring acts you know, for other human beings. Um, and as they are motivated by general, gen, genuine compassion and concern for those in need, and not just you know, some duty, some obligation, you know, get your ticket punched or you're know, paying your dues you know, so that you can move up to the next level. You know? um, the, you know, the determination will be made by you know, how much empathy you have for people who are struggling and how much you can you know, give sacrificially to make a difference in their life. What's interesting that not in you know, that criteria you know, is any requirement that you know, God should be worshiped. For the Levite and the priest heading to Jerusalem, you know, that was of the utmost concern. But you know, in this parable, as in the parable of the Good Samaritan, the um, um, the ritual duties you know, um, are at best in second place, and in this case, they're in zero place altogether. You know? um, there have been, you know, Jesus said to the you know, the blessed you know, sheep, you know, uh, "Come and receive your reward, which has been prepared, you know, from the beginning of, of creation." Um, and that inheritance, that inheritance which had been created from the beginning of creation was nothing less than paradise itself. Um, that's a pretty decent thing to come into. And so this parable also, you know, in, in its own way, helps us understand what a def the definition of the kingdom of God is like. You know? um, but in this situation, it's it's not as something that we experience in the physical reality that we know, you know but it will be experienced you know, in a reality that occurs to us after death. Um, another thing which you know, is uh, you know, involved in, in this parable is until Jesus sorted out the sheep and the goats, the, the good and the bad, you know, um, they freely mingled together. He had to sort them out, you know, put them here, put them there. Um, and you know, I think it's important that we, what we learn from this is that you know, um, exigent circumstances may cause some people to, to do bad things. That does not preclude the possibility that they will be forgiven and they'll be reconciled to God. You know? um, that we don't know. And what we deem as a sinner who's you know, unreconciled, unrepentant, you know, um, maybe, and we just don't know it, uh, or maybe on the verge of it, or in God's good own, only own good time, you know, they'll come to their senses and, and seek you know, God's pardon. You know. um, a sinner may be an angel in disguise. You know. Another thing, you know, which I think is a cautionary note about us, you know, you know not going into um, the, the business of judging. Uh, Jesus said this in various ways, such as, you know, judge not, least you be judged. You know? um, but what is, is probably even more important is that it is God who has reserved, you know, that right, you know, to, to make a final determination. Um, you know, Jesus delegated to us you know, the authority to absolve people of their sins, you know? uh, but actually, you know, as a delegated authority, you know, that can be overseen and by by God and, if necessary, reversed. Um, that, uh, in other words, you know, it's up to God to decide who's going, to, who he's going to spend eternity with. That's not our job. We don't get to pick and choose who our, our mates are going to be you know, in that uh, in that paradise. Um, another thing which I, I think is uh, uh, in, in this parable, and it's very pretty deep, you know, um, is that there's a a posture of, of pacifism. Um, and yeah. You know, um, 
Jesus is, you know, has said that you know, there will be a time, some, some, somewhere in the future, you know, not for you to know when, but in sometime in the future, where all this will be taken care of. But in the meantime, don't expect God to come in and clean up a dirty shop. You know? um, now that's, that's pretty harsh news. You know? um, because a lot of people, you know, particularly for those who knew the Jewish Jews history, uh, God had been a mighty warrior whose outstretched arm hood had encircled and protected them. You know? um, the holiest of their, their celebrations you know, honors the, the Passover where God rescued them from slavery in Egypt. Um, equally important, perhaps not in such a ritual way, but in, certainly in terms of their you know, origin stories, uh, was God's rescuing them from exile in Babylon. Um, and you know, Jesus was saying, listen, you know, um, we will do the sorting out, not in real time, not in physical reality, but we will do it at some future date. You know? um, and the, the unfortunate thing is that there's going to be innocent casualties you know, in, in the future because of this. You know? um, and you know, Jesus had to know this. He had to know that you know, the failure to intervene you know, uh, to protect innocent lives would mean that there will be innocent victims. Um, and he had to know that, you know, he would be counted among those innocents you know, who uh, refused to fight evil uh, and were uh, destroyed by evil. Um, that is, you know, it's something that, you know, perhaps is, you know, um, not so harsh on our ears you know, as modern people who think thought quite a bit about the, um, um, the sacrifice of Jesus. Um, but in his time and in most his people uh, to even hint at the idea that they could not count on God to take care of you know, the oppressive nature of the regime that was ruling them uh, would have been a horrible thing uh, to, to contemplate and to even propose. Um, yeah, um, so the parables, you know, have now two different functions. Um, the parable of the leaven and mustard seed, you know, stand in for uh, any number of parables which uh, describe uh, the kingdom of God as a present possibility. The parables of judgment, you know, like you know, the hall of great fish, you know, the uh, sheep and the goats, the uh, wheat and the tears, you know, um, you know the sheep and um, said that already. Um, these are parables of judgment, you know, of a future rec you know, reckoning you know, that uh, humanity is going to have to face. Um, and you know, it's possible to derive you know, some insights from cross-fertilization between the two types. But, uh, I believe they're, they are, are standalone genres you know, uh, answering you know, different questions. So when Jesus you know, was going about um, the highways and byways of Galilee and Judea, uh, announcing the kingdom of God, people wanted to know what it was like. You know? um, and probably you know, it was so ineffable that you know, he found it um, useful and um, practical you know, to make comparisons with things that, that people know and then they could draw their own conclusions about this kingdom that he was talking about. You know? um, and you know, the, the parables of judgment you know, um, sound sort of harsh on our ears because um, uh, you know, I think for a lot of people the idea that Jesus is you know, kind, loving, and understanding and all that you know, um, but he, you know, he certainly had the carrot, but he also had a stick. Uh, and uh, he's uh, telling people that stick you know, is not going to be used maybe in your own lifetime, um, but it will come into play at some point. You know, and um, you will 
Yeah, you will see God um, acting in justice, uh, God acting in uh, with fairness. So, so with that, uh, we'll close up for this evening. Um, and um, I don't think we have anybody in the audience tonight. So I will just close us with a, a prayer. Uh, and then we'll meet again next, uh, next Sunday. Our gracious and holy God, once again, we, we thank you for the revelations you know, about your nature and purpose that have come down to us from scripture. We are pleased to know that your spirit you know, works amongst us and with us, uh, giving us the opportunity and ability to understand in greater depth um, and in the broader reach you know, what you are trying to teach us about you know, your, your rule, your, your imperium, not the Roman imperium, or not the imperium of the United States of America. So we, we, uh, we feel truly blessed and privileged you know, to have you know, the experience of seeing your spirit help us understand things. You know, and for, um, also, we want to express our appreciation and gratitude for you know, those uh, men and women who, over the course of centuries, have ensured that we have received you know, this message and this self this self revelation um, with uh, uh, enough enough fidelity that you know we can come to conclusions. We ask your blessing on those who are in special need tonight and whether they be challenged in body, mind, or spirit. You know, um, give them a good night and bless us as well. We ask this in your son's name. Amen. Bye now. <laughs>